Well, thanks a lot for coming. I'm glad to see so many people here. Um, I've been a member of the society about two years, just as COVID was starting. So I've, I've been Zooming. I've seen a lot of the faces on Zoom, but the last couple of weeks, the first time I've had an opportunity to actually meet people. And that's been wonderful. And we've obviously got a lot of additional people tonight who are going to join the society before they leave tonight. <laughs> Uh, I'd just like again to introduce my wife, Linda. <laughs> she's she's learning Wiganese. She's she's a, she's doing pretty good at understanding people, but she can't speak proper yet. <laughs> um, before I say anything else, I want to thank Paul, who's vice chair, and uh, Claire, who's secretary. Uh, they really keep the society going. I think chair's better title for chair. Claire will be uh, chief executive officer, the, the secretary. Thanks a lot to everybody who keeps the society running smoothly and uh, very successful. Uh, before I go any further, a lot of the information I'll present tonight are in, not all of it, but quite a bit of it are in two books. One that I wrote with my brother Ray in 1980, when I was back in Wigan for 18 months and really got delving into local history uh, and into myself too. Uh, and the other book, my brother Ray continued doing research on Highfield and Winston after I went back to when I went to America. So he published this, uh, Winston and the Highfield: A Further History. Both of these are online, I think on Wigan Wall. Is that right, Ron? Yeah. Uh, I want to present this to one of the people who are here tonight. Uh, TJ Hart, can you come up, please? Where are you? TJ. TJ is a young guy. I want to give him this to pass on to the next generation of youngsters who are going to keep local history alive. So thanks a lot for everything you do. So I'll be talking about the Pony Dick area. There, there was a white pony, Pony Dick, I'll show you that. There was a favorite Pony Dick Inn, and the area around Pony Dick was called Pony Dick. And I was born just up the road from there. So I'll tell you in some detail what I know about the history of that small area. Um, my emphasis will be on what a great experience was for me growing up in that area, what I learned from it. And right at the end of my presentation, I'll identify three people in that small area who really uh, influenced my life to a great degree. Um, so with that, we'll move to the first slide. I know some of you know Pony Dick very well because you live very close to that. Some of you probably don't know where it is very well. Just like I don't know much about Ince or Indley or uh, these other parts of Wigan. So it's focused on just a small area of Wigan. So I'm not going to say anything about Ince or Hindley or Standish. It's just on this small area around Pony Dick. So um, this is obviously a satellite photograph, a recent satellite photograph. And Pony Dick is, we've just lost there, just there. So for orientation, we've got uh, Billings Road. Where are we? Uh, where are we? That's the main railway, Pemberton uh, Railway Station there. Blundell's Old Collier is here. All these new developments only started in 1966, I think. Uh, when I was growing up, all this area was, was just uh, farmland. There was very little development, but isolated farmhouses. Winston Lee Hall is just here, just up from Pony Dick. Here is the original Winston Lee Hall, the, the moated hall. You can still see, if you dare to investigate it, three sides of the old moat. They're pretty much covered up, but they're still there. 
that was we don't know exactly when that was built probably 1400s 1300s 1200s we don't know somewhere around there Winston the Hall itself was built uh, about 1560 um, the Winston family built that and then in 1596 they sold it out to the Bankses and obviously I'm not saying any more about the history, early history of the hall, but I will go through some of the history of the Banks family and show how they developed part of the area around Pony Dick, uh, what they did to spend their money and how they blew it. <laughs> uh, further up the road here, we've got uh, Windy Arbor up here, the M6. Um, this is uh, uh, spring pool, uh, gleed wood, and a lot of the other uh, old buildings I'll be talking about. You can't really see it on this resolution, but they're, they're all within this area, a few hundred yards around Pony Dick. If anybody who's driven down the road from Wigan up to Windy Arbor, you'll cross Pony Dick. Uh, in this area. This is Rylance Mill Bridge that comes over Billings Road. This is Billings Road, uh, Pemberton, Billings Road, Wigan. From here, it's uh, Pemberton Road, Winstonley. If you got to Windy Arbor, you've got Winstonley Road, Winstonley. So <laughs> it gets a bit complicated. Uh, underneath here flows Smithy Brook. The entrance to Winstonley Hall is just up here, the farmhouse is here. A Pony Dick Inn, which I'll show you some old photographs about, used to be right in behind here, the bottom of Ribsford Road today. Um, Banks's Winstonley Colliery line came down uh, from several collieries uh, near Windy Arbor. Uh, some of them went down to the pier, Wigan Pier, and in the 1860s, they built a railroad that came across the road here, and disappeared down there to connect with the main line uh, in the summer sales. That's not much evidence of any good history left there, so we'll try and reveal it. So first of all, let's go back a thousand years. Uh, the first mention of Winston, as far as I found, was in the Doomsday Book of 1086. It was spelled Will Budsley, which was Winstonley. You can see the Smithy Brook coming down here and flowing into Wigan. They don't have the hydrology right around here, but that was Smithy Brook. You notice that Wigan wasn't mentioned in the Doomsday Book. Uh, one explanation I've heard for that is, well, let's look at the purpose of the Doomsday Book. It was uh, set up by uh, William, uh, the new king, to establish who owned what so we can get taxes from them. So he already, as far as we know, didn't have much trouble in understanding that he already owned Wigan, the, the old Wigan parish. They were already paying taxes to him. So his interest was to establish other places around where they would have to pay taxes to him. So Winston Lee was rated at two ox gangs and a bit, which I don't know exactly how much that was, but my best guess is around 100 acres at that time. So I'm just going to show you three slides, just quickly going through why I consider this a very interesting, rich area to be brought up in. There's a diverse world of buildings, starting with, of course, the Winston Hall. I'm not going to say much specifically about the hall or its current state. That's a separate talk. May Mill, at the bottom of today's high, high of cricket ground, um, on Blundell's property. The first mill there was built in 1850. It was called Wilde's Mill. It was a, you know, a woolen mill. That suffered the Wigan scourge of getting burnt down. <laughs> 1859, it was rebuilt by Joseph Roper, 
who also owned uh, Pepper Mill in Wigan, some of you might know. That also suffered the Wigan scourge of being burnt down. <laughs> so in 19, 1889, they tried again and started building May Mill. That was the first uh, founding stone of May Mill. It was subsequently added to, I think, in 1906, it was a big addition. Uh, just after World War II, there were about 77,000 spindles in the mill. It was a pretty big mill. And then it was turned over to Courtauld's in 1962, 63, and they used it for making fiber for carpets. It was finally closed in 1980, subsequently demolished. There are a lot of photographs of May Mill. I included this one because particular, you can just make out a bit of structure here. Those were tennis courts. It used to be the side of the old cricket ground. I remember playing on those tennis courts back in the 50s around 1960. And of course, we've got the cricket ground itself, which next year celebrates its centenary. Uh, Blundell donated land in 1923 for the cricket ground and for the uh, graveyards behind Highfield Church. So uh, one of the first people buried in Highfield Church graveyard was my grandfather in 1923. The old buildings had a lot of these interior walls, wattle and daub, old sticks, horsehair and mud. That was very common around there. Of course, the other side towards Wigan, we all know, is a di totally different landscape of high density uh, terrace housing, row housing. So, carrying on great di diversity of landscapes. <laughs> you the people out there, Derek. Did it flip it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, so diversity of people. So we had, a, on the one hand, we had the squire at uh, Winston Le Hall. This was Merrick Banks in the 1800s. This was Blundell, who helped develop the Blundell collieries there in Highfield in the early 1800s. And his staff at Pemberton Colliery about 1890. So I always regard these people as the elite group. We were always a bit terrified of them. We were, we were a class above us. That was my granddad. He was a coal miner uh, at the colliery, Pem uh, Blundell's Colliery. The farm at uh, Pony Dick was run by the Four Acres. This was taken in uh, 1959, I think. So this was all Mr. Four Acre, Sam Four Acre, George, and Fred. Um, I remember working on their fields in the mid 50s before they had a tractor, working with horses, uh, getting in the, the, the wheat and the hay, potato picking and everything else. Oh, Sam was, a, the four acres, as far as I know, came up from Somerset in the late 1700s. Uh, there was a four acre who was footman at Winston the Hall. And then from there, they moved down to farming at, at Pony Dick. Sam, I put my beer somewhere. Where did you go? Thank you. Thank you. Sam still had a strong uh, Somerset accent. Uh, as kids around Highfield View, sometimes he'd come up and knock on our back door and take his cap off, scratch his head, and say, Can your Derek come and work up farm today? But sometimes we'd go down to the farm at Pony Dick and knock on his door and say, He's right doing up farm today, Sam, you know. And he'd take up his cap, scratch his head. He said, I'm <laughs> <laughs> That what? I'm <laughs> <laughs> Same response, no what? So we're obviously having communication problems. So I got out my book on English to English translation. And on the Lancashire part, it, uh, I, uh, what, what, you know, asking, I just couldn't understand him. That was easy enough. 
Ermini Arnyenia wasn't in the Lancashire diet, it came from Somerset. So when I figured out what he was saying, he was asking, how many of you are there? Ermini Arnyenia. So I said, three. He said, Ari, we're muck spreading today. <laughs> Yeah, so the other part of the diversity was the different landscapes. This is uh, Blundell's uh, spoil leaps down in Highfield towards uh, Loose Green. Uh, this is another photograph of Blundell, the same Blundell slabby, slag heaps, spoil heaps in the, in the distance. This particular shot was taken in 1969 from this point here, which, if, if you know the little shopping precinct at Winstonley, right in the middle there. And this was the old line coming through from Baxter's Pit and Windy Arbor going down to Wigan Pier. <laughs> this is what we call the Wigan Alps. So you didn't need to go to Switzerland or Austria skiing. You know, you used to get on top of the slag heap and slide down on your bum. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give you a bit of geology uh, because if you need to understand the course of development around Pony Dick, you need to know about coal and the coal formations and the faults, the geology. So I'll get, I'll start off very general and get very specific. So the, all the, the coal formations were formed about 300 million years ago. That was, they did, we, did, we hadn't even invented uh, dinosaurs at that point. And just at the time perspective, dinosaurs went extinct like 65 million years ago. So we're talking way before all that. So the continents were not in the same position, the shape as they are today. And Wigan would have been about up here. A bit warmer, <laughs> near the tropics. And the coal from swamps, terrestrial swamps like this, which were compressed over time and formed the coal. Um, okay, a bit, bit of geology. So let's start with, with the bottom one. Forget this, that's interesting but not relevant to what I'm going to say. So this is a vertical cross section of the geology through the Wigan area from west to east. So this would be Billinge Hill, Wigan, Hay and uh, Winter Hill up on the other side. So all the material that was deposited would originally have been laid in fairly flat layers. Uh, there were about 3,000 feet of material deposited over this three or 500 million year period of the Carboniferous period. So in, in the Wigan area here, there were over 30 coal seams in all. That represented only about 4% of all the deposits over this period. Most of it was sandstone, shale and mudstone. So the coal seams varied in depth between 2 inches and 9 feet. So the richest coal seams in the Punidic area were these two bottom seams, the oral five foot and the oral four foot, also known as the, uh, the Smith and the Arley seams. So over time, all these horizontal beds would have got deformed by earth movements, which forced up the land around Billinge Hill, sank on the Wigan, and then the same rocks came up again in hay the other side. So we're particularly interested in the geology in this part, the you know, Winstonley Wigan boundary. So, <clears throat> looking over here, this is Wigan, the canal, River Douglas going through here, uh, Windy Arbor up here, the white dot will be Pony Dick. So initially, the coal development pre-industrial times would have been in small coal pits built throughout this area, but particularly in the Winstonley area of what we today, what Donald, Donald Adamson called the oral coal field, going from Shevington 
the canal area up to near Windy Arbor. These boundaries of it were created by geological faults where the land slipped or was thrust out. So the area of that coal field was, was limited by geological faults. Those two richest coal seams I talked about, the oral five foot and four feet, occurred at the surface here and at shallow depths. And they were rich quality coal. So that's why the oral coal field was the first to be developed in a serious manner throughout the whole area. Because you had rich coal at or near the surface. So prior to industrial development in Winstonley, all the small pits and coal mining in Winstonley has been dated back to 1507. So it's been going on for hundreds of years before the Industrial Revolution in small quantities. Then starting about 1750, well 1740s, the Douglas Navigation was opened from Wigan through uh, Gathurst and out to the River Douglas. So that opened up the potential for exporting coal from this area along the waterways. Previous to that, all the coal would have been moved by horse and cart. So the first area to be developed was down near the uh, River Douglas, down here, and gradually coal mining extended to the south. In 1792, John Clark, who was a very rich Liverpool merchant banker, made all his money in Liverpool from the slave trade, like a lot of people did, decided to invest in the coal seams, leasing the coal seams all up in this area. In 1792, they entered an agreement with the Squire Banks of Winston Lee Hall to mine this land here. So if, if you know the Pinga, Good End Brook Lane from Pemberton, as you're going into Winstonley, that south side of that, around Winstonley Hall, um, was the first major lease he had. Um, he was doing very well. He was the one that built uh, Oral Mount. You might know Oral Mount if you go to a nice restaurant. He built that for his home. In 1812, 1810, he hired... Um, Robert Daglish as his manager. Robert Daglish, before he hired him, was manager of Hay Foundry, working for uh, uh, Balcaris and Bradsays. But they hired him to manage his collieries here. And Daglish developed what we call the Yorkshire Horse, steam locomotive, to take coal from here down to the canal, which was opened in 1780. So all these developments on the, this area obviously would have affected Pony Dick. The, the inn was there, the pub was there. It would have got a lot of use from the workmen on these coal seams and developing the early railways. By the, the way, that railway I mentioned, I'll show you a map later, but that walking horse and the early railway from Winstonley down to the canal was the third successful steam locomotive anywhere in the world. We don't have more um, record and recognition of it in the Wigan area. So that, his first lease was 1792. In 1812, he extended the lease to mine coal up to in the Longshire area. And the steam locomotive extended up there. So all this was mining the oral five and four foot coal seams near or close to the surface. Then other entrepreneurs like Blundell, who had also started mining up here in the 1760s, 1770s, decided to expand their operations and Blundell bought much of the land here and leased a lot more land uh, just south of Pemberton Station. But there, the oral five foot and four feet seams, you had to go down 1800 feet to get the coal seams. So we started off back, this is a diagram below here. So the oral coal field, those two rich oral five foot and four feet seams were at or near the surface. In this area, the same coal fields, because of geological changes, put those down right 1800 feet. 
1815 when Blundell started mining uh, at Highfield. He started mining these top coal seams above it. It was only in 1870 that he went 1800 feet deep to mine the whole five foot and four feet seams. This line here represents the southern limit of the oral coal field. It's called the Tinker House Fault. That's why there's a southern boundary to the oral coal field. Along here, the land, there's further major fault and the land slips down six or seven hundred feet here. And then where Blondel was, as I said, down to 1800 feet. So in the 1830s, uh, Squire Banks decided to establish his own coal mines between the Tinker House Fault and this fault, which was the Great Pemberton Fault. So the, the, the timing and how these coal seams were developed depends upon the very specific geology where the faults were, where the quality seams were. <clears throat> One of the challenges of coal mining was always to get rid of a lot of water in the coal mines. If you couldn't get rid of the water, you couldn't mine the coal. So originally, before the Industrial Revolution, they, they built these soughs or sows, I'm not sure how you, you want to pronounce it. Soughs. So, so th this was the sough they built from Winston, near Winston Lee Hall, coming out in the Smithy Brook near Pony Dick, about half a mile long. So you fancy getting on your belly every day, up there, mining it, <laughs> with uh, three or four ventilation shafts, that's all. You're all on your stomach with your pick, clearing that so they could drain the water. How did they divide it with the skull, I guess? Uh, not that I know of, just through solid sandstone. So this is a map of the early railway, Collie Railways, and again, the red dot is Pony Dick. So that early railway, uh, uh, Daglish's railway, this, this is um, uh, the canal at Crook. So that railway came from Crook, had several offshoots in Pemberton, came across the valley at the Pingot, and that first lease in 1792 operated these mines, and then in the 1812 lease extended down to Longshaw. So all this coal was sent down, first of all, to the navigation and then to the canal and shipped out to the sea. Uh, Blundell, the Yellow Lines, started mining in 1815. Um, he didn't use early steam locomotives for a while. So his lines from his collieries up here went down to the canal near Seven Stars Bridge. It was a, just a horse and gravity method of transport. That's why Victoria Street, anybody who knows it is so straight, it used to be the line of Blundell's that Colliery Railway. So his mines, uh, his main pits, engine pit and by pit here, but his first mines were Fireman's Pit. If you, if you know uh, Holmes House Drive, just go down Holmes House Drive, uh, about 100 yards just on your left is where one of his first pits was, called Fireman's Pit. I've lost it. There. And it went across Smithy Brook, it must have been on a, a wooden bridge. That joined up with other mines that he had, just 100 yards up from Pony Dick was Mill Pit. You can still see the cap over it if you know where you're looking. Then these two lines were the Venture Pits, where the Venture Pub is now. It's called Venture because Vundell's Pit was called Venture Pit. That was Lower Venture Pit. And up at Venture Pit used to be just over the other side of the railway. They had to put a special bridge over the railway and they built it in 1848 to accommodate him bringing coal down. And then uh, in 1830s, Banks developed his own coal mines in this area. The first one, number one pit, was, if you know the houses, line of old houses, as you're going up, 
Wellbrow on the left, the cottages. Just opposite there on the other side of the road behind was Banks's number one pit. Number two pit was a bit further down, um, opposite where Holmes House Drive is now. Number three pit was Baxter Pit. Number four pit was Windy Arbor. And then in uh, about 1889, they opened Leyland Green Pit, which would have been down here, and fed it into this railway system uh, going down into Wigan. That Leyland Green Pit uh, wound its last coal in uh, 1927. That used to go down to Wigan Pier and tipped into the canal barges. So it's not surprising in 19... Uh, 1929, two years after Leyland Green closed, that they demolished Wigan Pier because there was no more coal coming down from Winston the Collieries. Uh, in the 1860s, Blundell also put in a new line from Pony Dick that I showed you in that first photograph, coming across near Rylands Mill Bridge and going out through the summer sales to connect with the mainline railway. All those pits I mentioned, and there were a lot of them, like the words around Wigan, would have looked something like this. This is um, Baxter's number three pit. So, going into some of the owners of Winston the Estate, uh, these dates are the the names are the names of the Squire Banks's, not the birthday and death date, but when they became in charge of Winstonley Estate and when they died. So William Banks was in charge of the Winstonley Estate from 1748 to 1775. This is an important period when the start of the Industrial Revolution. As I mentioned, they started mining coal um, in the oral coal field near, near the Crook and Gathers. They opened up water transport. So he, was, he got pretty interested in the possibility for developing coal in his own estate in Winston. He married Anne, you want to say, Linda, how do you say that? <laughs> how do you teach anybody to pronounce that as Chumley? <laughs> From Port Vale in Cheshire. And, the connections with Cheshire will stay strong with the banker's family. I'll show you in subsequent slides. In 1770, he was obviously getting prepared for coal mining development expansion, and he, he developed um, an estate map in 1770. And this is a fraction of it at Pony Dick. This was the old mill, the mill pond. I'll show you this in more detail later. Uh, this was flax yards. There's quite a lot of evidence for growing flax around Pony Dick in the early days, and there must have been some local weavers. Hall Lane Cottages, that I'll show you photographs of later. We just come up from Pony Dick towards the hall, just 100 yards on the right, there's the Hall Lane Cottages, it was Fir Tree Cottage and uh, Birch Tree Farm. We've got Jim and Hilary Waring here who live in, in uh, Hall Lane Cottages today. So William Banks died in 1775. His son, William Banks again, took over until 1800 when he died. In 1780, he, he uh, had the first major renovations of the hall for a few hundred years. This is a photograph, that little sign up there actually says 1780 in the back of the hall. So this was the first major renovation of the hall. And as I mentioned before, he started leasing coal to John Clark to develop coal in Winstonley in 1792. And that's when uh, John Clark built this stone viaduct across the Smithy Brook in, in the Pingot, the bottom of Brook Lane. First of all, they had carts and horses transporting the coal. And in 1813, there was that walking horse that third successful steam locomotive in the world going over there. Some 
few of the old remnants of Clark's activities. This is Pony Dick again. Uh, just here, if you, go, if you go along the old Banks line to the summer sales, Banks, uh, Clark's first two pits were the engine pit on the north side of the railway and then the by pit on the south side. That is the cap to uh, Clark's uh, by pit. I remember in the summer sales where the level crossing is, if you, if you know it, looking just to the west, and when you have the steam locomotives there, they used to, steam locomotives they used to pull in by the side here and pump water out of Clark's old mine. One of Clark's other pits was just a bit further up by what was Tucson House. And as far as I know, this was built by Clark for one of his colliery managers, probably about 1790. This was uh, Tucson House as I remember it in uh, about 1979, later demolished. The Nicholson's operated, lived in Tucson House and operated this building behind them. Just, just here. This was one of Clark's other pits where coal mining are finished, but there's a lot of useful water in there. So when Wigan Corporation built oral reservoirs, our water park today, they pump water from here to fill the reservoirs. So that William Banks died in 1800 and he, he, uh, he had no male heirs. So the estate went to Thomas Holm, who was his cousin. Thomas Holm was curator of a Holland church and owned Holland House and all the coal mines around that area too. So when the two families merged, Banks's had a much richer source for the coal mining. He didn't live too long. His son, Merrick Holmes, was in charge of the estate from 1803 to 1827. He had to change his name from home to Banks because of the lack of continuity of the Banks family. This was Merrick, the original Merrick Banks the first. He married Maria Elizabeth Langford Brook from near Hall, Cheshire. So we go back to the Cheshire link. That Langford Brook family were major slave owners in Antigua. So Banks is married to a rich slave owning family, like a lot of other people did at the time. Mere Hall was remodeled in 1813, 1813 by Lewis Wyatt. The second coal lease that John Clark that I mentioned started in 1812 under uh, Merrick Banks the first. He did major remodeling of the hall when he started getting good coal money coming in 1818, 1819 by Lewis Wyatt, the same guy who developed uh, Mayor Hall. That's when the Father Neptune in the middle of the courtyard would have been first built. <clears throat> so Merrick Holm passed away in 1827 and it went to his son Merrick Banks II. So here we have a painting of Merritt Banks in front of Winston Lee Hall with Pony Dick, White Pony Dick. And this was uh, William Starkey, who I'll say much more about, but he was the, in charge of the horses and stables at the hall. This would have been some gentry person riding Pony Dick. Well, it doesn't look like Pony Dick would have done very well in the Grand National, but he was obviously a favourite horse. Merrick Banks II from 1827 to 1881 married Eleanor Starkey of Knutsford, Cheshire again in 1836. And she was pretty young, I think she was still a teenager. So some of her family came up with her to the hall. Um, William Starkey, probably her brother, I'm not sure, also brought a couple of other family members. They were put in charge of the horses and stables at the hall, and William Starkey was made landlord 
of what was then called the Horse and Jockey Inn at Pony Dick in 1837. And the name was changed to Favourite Pony Dick Inn in 1864. Some years later, James Starkey, who was grandson to this William Starkey, established a wheelwright's business next to the inn at Pony Dick. And I'll show you some photographs of that. Before I carry on on the sequence of my slides, there's a gentleman just reminded me to say a few words. Uh, he lives in Pertree Cottage up Springpool. Uh, some interesting connections between where I was born on Highfield View and Springpool, the buildings up there. Highfield View, where I was born, there used to be a very old cottage called Cropper's, Copper's, Copper's House uh, before it was demolished to build Highfield View. That was said to be a beautiful old whitewashed cottage with a thatched roof, which you don't see much of around here. But the, the person who had the house that my mum and dad bought in 1937, before them, was a Mr. Southworth. And uh, it turns out he was valet to the Squire Banks. But when Highfield View was built in the 1890s by George Holland, who lived in Springpool, he was a manager for banks in Winston the Collieries. And he made his money from selling gunpowder to the coal miners. So with that money, he built Highfield View. Up in Springpool, was two big old houses, one called Pertree Cottage and one uh, um, Cropper, Cropper's House. Cropper was an interesting person um, in the early 1800s. He was a very successful merchant in Liverpool, but unlike most of the Liverpool merchants who were heavily involved in slavery making the money, he was a strong abolitionist. He was very strong in helping get rid of slavery. Uh, and he married, guess who he married? He married a Winston. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. From Sandy Firth Farm, Sandy Firth Farm near New Windy Alba. Um, they were Quakers and they had all the meetings in Quaker House near Sims Lane Inn. The same member of that Winston family became Camden Professor of History at Hartford College, Oxford, where I went 150 years later. In Pertree Cottage, that, that's maybe older than uh, Copper's House. Um, in the early 1960s, it was, uh, it was a high-class restaurant. Pertree, Pertree, Pertree Cafe. Pertree Cafe. And a lot of famous celebrities dined there, uh, Epstein and that little group from Liverpool called the Beatles. <laughs> so there's a lot of old history in there. I just wanted to throw that in. Thanks for the reminder. Um, so moving on, we, we left uh, Merrick, Merrick Banks marrying Eleanor Starkey uh, of Knutsford. <clears throat> William Starkey was the stableman at Winstonley Hall and he was given to become landlord at, at the favourite Pony Dick Inn at Pony Dick, this building. That apparently used to be called the Bay Horse or Horse and Jockey before it was changed to favourite Pony Dick Inn. So this was the inn itself, it's double gable. The story is that there used to be two separate cottages there. When they wanted to merge it into one to develop the inn, there was a, an old lady lived in the back one, and she wouldn't sell out. So being ingenious, they found a way of getting her out. <laughs> so two of the lads went up on the roof and put some sods over a roof and smoked her out. <laughs> Well, of course, that wouldn't be anybody from Pony Dick. He probably brought them in from St. Helens or Liverpool. <laughs> anyway, that was the old inn, and that was the wheelwright's business that uh, Joseph Starkey uh, developed about 1890. 
Interestingly, at the back here, it's the only photograph I know of that old mill pit. This is the old mineral line that Banks built from his Winston the Colliery's through Pony Dick here, going through to the summer sales to connect with the main railroad. So 100 yards just up there was one of Banks' first pits built in probably 1830s. That's the only evidence I, I can find of it. It's another photograph of all the old folks, uh, young folks too, I think, at Pony Dick Inn, probably about 1890. This was a photograph of people at uh, Pony Dick, about 1875. This little boy here turned out to be this gentleman, James Starkey, who built the wheelwright's shop here. He, he was apprenticed with Hesketh in Walgate in building these beautiful coaches and uh, trucks. That was his father. Uh, Joseph Starkey. I think he was the one that actually was landlord of the inn there, uh, which closed in 1924. He lost the license partly because I think Joseph was consuming quite a lot of his own profits. <laughs> this is an example of some of the beautiful carts that uh, Starkey used to make there in the wheelwrights business. I just put in a little note here that one of the Stark is married into the Winstonleys. Surprise, surprise. And uh, Winstonley, this was one of the uh, Starkey family members who told me this. They remember seeing a gold signet with the Winstonley coat of arms. Uh, and the Winstonley motto was Grata Sume Manu, which I love. It means, in, in, unless you're fluent in Latin, you probably don't know. It means take with a grateful hand. <laughs> So as well as before he, they were in the horse business there, looking after the horses in Winstonley Hall, but uh, one of them, that James Starkey, uh, before he developed his wheelwright business, was in the slaughterhouse business at Seven Stars. <laughs> Must have been before the bone works at Affley Bridge, I think. <laughs> so going back to Banks's. That Merritt Banks II had two daughters, Eleanor Starkey Letterer Banks and Maria Ann Banks. If you know, if you remember some of the old streets just south of Wigan Pier, between, Wigan, between the canal and the river, west of Eckersley's, the two streets called Eleanor and Letterer. That's where they got the names from because Banks used to own that land. Eleanor Starkey, letter of Banks, married John Murray, who later changed his name to Banks. He was already a patient in the Morningside Asylum up in Scotland. <laughs> I'm not saying any more about that. And his other daughter was Maria Ann Banks. But I think this was the start of a lot of problems with uh, the, the Banks' financial situation. Merrick became pretty eccentric in his old age, and he split his resources between his two daughters. Um, in 1882, and it was a very detailed, long, expensive litigation. <clears throat> what, okay, now some of the bank spending in the 1800s. Merrick Banks bought, in 1835, letter to her house in Ross and Cromarty in Scotland, right to 1,000 acre estate. And that descended to his daughter Maria in 1881, who sold it in 1901 to Lord Zetland for 70,000 pounds, which today will be 10 million. Today, that's you can you can have your uh, wedding reception if you want. In there. And they also bought Balcony Castle in Scotland in Cromarty, bought by. Merrick Banks' son, George Hildred Banks, and his mother, Eleanor Starkey Letterer Banks, in 1890, which they kept till 1948, and then they sold it to Monroe, who by then it was pretty dilapidated, and he demolished it in 1968. So it was Eleanor who actually owned the estate from 1882 to 1907. 
George Hildred Banks died in 1947. His will, when he died, was £440,000, about £16 million pounds today. His widow, Amy Oakley Strathclyde, died a few years later, and her will had gone down to 25000 She must have gone to Harrod shopping quite a bit or something. <laughs> This is sort of a summary of all the banks' expenditures in the 1800s. <clears throat> they uh, had major renovations to the hall in three major periods during 1780, 1818, and 1840s. They bought Bispam Hall, Hockley Hall, Clapgate, and Stonehouse Estates. They bought Grenard, an 81,000 acre letter estate, and Balcone Castle, Castle in Scotland. Uh, they, bought, they, made, they built Wigan and Billings Lodges to the estate and also a pollen lodge on Winston New Road. They bought, built the big uh, hall, uh, barn, sorry, at Pony Dick in 1841. A lot of you probably know the stone wall around the estate, we used to call it the long wall. They built that around 1880. And then there was also major landscaping at Lee Dam in the spring pool. The new cover because they wanted to build it up for pheasant hunting, game, game hunting, and a big fish pond. They also had a big uh, boat called the Irish at Liverpool. They used to go up to Scotland and Iceland uh, for salmon fishing. And of course, I've already mentioned, they developed their own collieries. Instead of leasing the land, they now started building their own collieries in the 1830s with a railway down to Wigan Pier. Just to show some of the that landscape improvements they did to the hall, this is in 1894 on the survey map. So we've got Winston the Hall is here. That's the old moat house that I mentioned earlier. This is Pony Dick. So they had a big dam at Lee Wood. All around the hall, there was landscape, beautiful lakes, fountains were built. Behind Spring Pool, which is here, they big this cascade of beautiful uh, pools cascading from one to the other. I remember walking through that in 1980. You could still make out it then, but I'm sure now it's totally overgrown. They also... Uh, built a big fish pond here down near Pony Dick in the 1880s, which in the 1920s they leased to the Pack Horse Angling Club. They used to fish there until about the 1940s when fish pond uh, just got filled up with mud and ochre. So carrying on with the Banks story, George Hildred Murray changed his name to Banks. He was in charge of the hall from 1907 to 1949, and this is when we really saw a downward spiral uh, of the um, activities at the hall. Some of the main reasons, the major collieries around there were beginning to go down, Blundell's collieries, uh, that Pony Dick Inn, was, and the, the, the wheelwright's business was closed in 1924. The old mill at Pony Dick, which I'll mention again shortly, was demolished in 1927. And in World War I and World War II, the military were uh, housed at the hall, which probably didn't do too much for the, the conditions in the hall. George Hildred Banks' daughter, Joyce Helena Murray, um, she actually married John Jarvis Murray Banks, whose name was already Banks. He didn't change it. He was already a Banks from a different part of the family. During her reign, Winston Estate was up for sale in 1941. There's a catalog of all the different buildings on the estate and the condition. Most of them were pretty run down and it obviously didn't sell. Uh, just after the war, like a lot of uh, uh, good old English buildings and estates, they suffered from high estate taxes. That really impacted them a lot. Uh, finally, a lot of the land, as we saw in that first satellite photograph in Winstonley and Highfield, was sold for housing estates. 
So uh, I'll tell you a little story about John Jervis Merrybank. So when I was a teenager, like a lot of other people, we had a big bonfire, usually at the side of the cricket ground in Ifield, where the bowling club is. And we used to go around cutting wood, you know, building it up for a couple of weeks before the bonfire. So one day, the three or four of us down in the summer sails, the other side of the wall where we shouldn't have been in the old uh, fish pond there, and a lot of dead trees. So we had our axes cutting down the trees, you know, not doing any harm, right? Then one of the lads shouts, Captain Banks! <laughs> Well, I, I was a rugby player, I played on the wing, so I was pretty nippy, and I was pretty good at long jump and high jump, so I, I scaled the wall first. Captain Banks dabbed me, put me in the back of his Land Rover, took me to our old police station, <laughs> <laughs> confiscated me dad's axe. <laughs> <laughs> then I got back home, and my mum comes home, and she'd been up Pemberton with the next door neighbour, and they were talking, and next door neighbor says to me, Mom, hey, that looks like your Derek at back at that pickup. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to tell her the story when she got back. So continuing, uh, Eleanor, Mary, John Jervis, Mary Banks had sons, James, who uh, I think died of unfortunate circumstances a few years ago, and Tim, who the director for Wigan Hall Developments, and he's still heavily involved in the hall today. Winston Hall, as we know, was sold to Dobcrest in 2000, so uh, we, know, we know the state of affairs there. So going back to Pony Dick, here we are at Pony Dick, the old inn and, and uh, wheelwrights business here. Uh, Highfield. This is the old copper's house I mentioned, where Highfield View is, Highfield Farm. There was an old Sumner's Hall back up the pit road here. And as far as I know, the first reference to that was uh, before 1466. It was a very old hall. Um, in 1938, they started building a summer sales colliery here. It was a upcast for coal mining at Blundell's Colliery Highfield. So they're underground, they're transporting coal from there and bring it up at the surface here, some of the sales colliery. And in 1944, they actually built their own shaft and brought the coal up from there. That was a drift mine. This was a fish pond I mentioned to you from about 1880 to uh, 1940. Um, Here is the old farmhouse, Wigan Lodge, just further up the road. This is Smithy Brook. And there was a mill, a very old mill, just here. And they built the mill pond here. It was ingenious where they got the water to continuously provide water for the mill. I don't know when the mill was built. I'm guessing it was probably the 1500s, because Rylance, it was called Rylance Mill, Rylance Mill Bridge. And when Banks bought the estate from Winston's in 1596, there was a Ryland who lived on the estate. So I'm presuming that was the same Ryland who gave his name to the mill. Um, way back, perhaps 1500s, 1600s, we started diverting some of the water from Smithy Brook as a separate channel to provide water into the mill pond here. They also got water from further up the whole lane. If some of you remember the figure eight fish pond, we used to call it. So they brought excess water in there too. So the, the mill used to be just here, a drying kiln right next to it. As far as we know, it was a wooden water mill that fed from the top, the water discharged near Pony Dick here. Some early records from the mill at Pony Dick from 1669-1671. This shows you that they were obviously grinding wheat, barley, meal, malt. 
and the amount that they were grinding in those uh, few years uh, measured in windles and pecks, so I didn't bother to try and translate that. <laughs> Chipping up. And it's just some of the events that occurred to show that this really was a around Pony Dick, the old inn, really was a big community center for everything that was happening within six or seven hundred yards of there. And so David Sinclair in his book in 1882 describes a, a purring match, a pouring match, I'd probably say. Pour, Foreign, foreign. So they had two colliers, both wearing wooden clogs with iron tips, of course. No holes barred, kicking, biting, whatever. And they had 20, 30 onlookers. And the winner finally drove his right foot on the other skull, who lay senseless on the ground. And he said, I've, not, I've, I've fought 17 battles and never been bitten before. <laughs> so this is like a Mike Tyson. <laughs> And the win winner claimed his prize, which was a pair of new clogs. <laughs> so back to Pony Dick. This was a, an example of the beautiful craftsmanship on the carts that were built by Starkeys. Pony Dick Inn used to serve as a real community centre, apart from uh, serving food and putting people up. It, the hall, the, the, the room upstairs, uh, was a center of activity during the coal strikes. That's where they would have the meetings. That's where they organized all the funerals. That's where they had meetings of the Wigan, uh, sorry, the Winstonley Horticultural Society and so on. That was really the hub of the community. And in the old inn, it was a low beam uh, bar, uh, a lot of uh, mugs hanging down. Uh, they were all uh, actually bl blue and white. Mugs. Some of the members of the Starkey family, I'm sure, still have these mugs and uh, some of the early records of the, the businesses there. So you can see some of the demise. Pemberton Colliery's profits in 1920 were about 60,000 pounds. By 1925, they dropped to 8,000. Another example of the uh, the dry up in money that affected all these resources at that time. The, the wheelwright's turnover in 1922 was £475. Two years later, when the inn closed, it had dropped to £23. That was devolved. The, the Pony Dick Inn was demolished in 1954. So, in front of Winstonley Hall, um, this is about 18. 80 for 1880, I think, photograph playing tug of war. This old tree, this is in on the north side of the hall behind the stables. So, this is Winstonley Hall, the stables were here. So, that clump of trees there would have been the same tree that was there. That's where Pony Dick was buried. Pony Dick, aged 36. Died in 1841. His gravestone is still there. Uh, <laughs> so, on to Blundell's Pemberton Colliery, just a few hundred yards from Pony Dick. Um, there was a massive complex at its peak. Uh, we were mining about 700,000 tons of coal a year. By 1870, they'd gone down to these two rich oral coal seams that I mentioned and production really skyrocketed. Uh, that's, that was when they sunk the Queen Pit and King Pit. It's a beautiful building for the Hege. This is a map of all Blundell's colliery estate that I prepared with input from George Jepson, who used to live near Pony Dick. And I got him to describe every one of the buildings. They're all numbered. We've got a record of another sheet describing what each building was. Uh, Blundells were very generous in donating money to build community resources. Uh, the old Iron Church, it was called, was a church school. It was both a church and served as an initial boys' school starting in 1867. 
And after that, they built the other schools, the primary school, junior school, and they built the church in 1890s. Uh, General Blondo built that in memory of his wife, Beatrice, who was lady in waiting to Queen Victoria. Uh, 1930s, I think, there was nothing left. You know. So about Pony Dick, this was the Torica's farm at Pony Dick, and the barn that uh, Banks is built in 1841, who used to work. This is the, that's the front of the farmhouse, this is the back of the farmhouse. Interesting old building, I don't know the exact date of it, but you can see the, the complexity of the brickwork and stonework at the bottom, the different stories going up. This body churn came out of the old barn uh, about eight, 1980. Up the whole lane, one of the buildings was Birch Tree Farm, which has been completely renovated. Uh, in 1980, I took this photograph of the old Yorkshire, or Staffordshire range. It came up from Staffordshire about 1880. And this was a photograph of Wigan Lodge just up from Tony Dick. So going back to the mill at Pony Dick, uh, I used to work with John Foraker, who was a few years older than me. But one day he told me he'd done a painting of the old mill, and this is what he'd done. So this was the actual old mill. This was the, 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 the drying kilns at the side. That's a photograph I took of exactly the same spot uh, in 1980. No remnants of it. The mill was demolished. Two big grindstones. One was taken up to the moat house near the original Winston the Hall, and the other is still down there, still buried down there. The whole lane cottage is just up from uh, up the hall from Pony Dick. Jim and Hillary here bought this in the 1980s. That was the state of it. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> but I remember going in there in the about 1960, uh, Mr. Winston used to live in this part, he, he grew beautiful roses, and the Deardins used to live in this place, and we used to go and get bags of apples from there. But they moved out about 1961, so it had been empty for over 20 years when Jim and Hillary bought it in the 1980s, and completely redone it, so that's where it is today. It's just amazing. That's one of my favorite places in the whole of England. It's it's reported to have been an old school originally, perhaps a schoolmaster's house in the old school. In front of that was a typical example of some of the fencing, the flagstone fences that were up in, in uh, around the uh, Coppice House and Pear Tree. I'm sure you still have some of the old fencing. The roof was also uh, flagstone. I've taken liberties here and show you upstairs here in Jim and Hillary's house the fantastic old beans. Huh? Yeah? <laughs> I crept in when you were asleep, Hillary. <laughs> it's interesting where they might have come from. Uh, we don't know the exact age when this was built. My brother Ray was a, a, a forensic chemist. And back in 1980, he did an analysis of the paint on some of the old wind metal window frame, iron window frames. And he found 52 layers of paint. So if you reckon they painted every eight years and it's 400 years old, if they painted every 10 years, it's 500 years old. So. And this is the beautiful barn at the side of the cottage here that Jim and Hillary have also renovated. Right in the middle, underneath that, was uh, a shaft that went down to that sough that I showed you. It came out just further down here. It was one of the ventilation shafts.
So I'm getting towards the end. Uh, some of the buildings that have been lost. This was Sumner's Hall uh, behind Highfield View where I live, dating back to the 1400s. That was demolished in 1954. Uh, Holmes House Farm. Rainford Cottage, which if you know Holmes House, you come in from the main road about 100 yards on your right, and that was Rainford Cottage. Built 1765, demolished 1967. This was the colliery behind Sumner's Hall, right behind where we live. These were some of the stones going down to the engine house down here. This is the engine house and pit baths. Uh, those were later developed as small uh, businesses after the you know, mining had ceased. And this was a uh, remnant of <laughs> Winston the Wall. <laughs> Most of it's been demolished, I think. Okay, Pemberton Railway Station, uh, Enfield Street Rail Railway Hotel, Railway Station here. So these be a row of shops here. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, off license at the end, then your newspaper shop, Uncle Billy Ferris shop there. Uh, he had three daughters, two of whom lived in with him he had another daughter who came very posh lived up Wigan Lane <laughs> and her daughter was Lucille from Coronation Street so this is the old Pemberton Railway station that was demolished around 1980 the old in the booking hall they used to lean on there and order your tickets from Gordon and this was the clock that was in the booking hall. This was saved. It was taken down to the uh, British Museum in London. So coal mining came to an end in the 1980s. There's open cast uh, just to the left as you go up Wellbry from Pony Dick. This was behind uh, the railway in uh, Blundell's old site. And there was also a drift mine at uh, Pony Dick for a while. So my last slide comes back to where I was born. This is an aerial photograph. I was born right there on Highfield View. That's where I grew up. Well, that's where I started to grow up. It's a long-term process. And sometimes you start going downhill. But... <laughs> That's where I started. So this was Akers. This, this was about 1962. This was Akers' farm, the old farmhouse, stables, midden heap, so on. So this house here was owned by the Richardsons. William Richardson built it in about 1920. And he he was director from for two engineering companies, like Park Engineering, was it? And, and English Tools. And he had two sons, Alan and Frank. Alan became Dean at York Minster. Frank was headmaster at um, St. Mark's. St. Paul's, thank you. <laughs> Just seeing if you're awake. <laughs> St. Paul's. So the few kids around here used to play on what, the pit road. This went up to Somersales Pit. So this was a nice, fairly level surface. So that was our cricket pitch, our football pitch, our roller skating pitch and everything. So when we played cricket, quite often we used to send the ball over into Mr. Richardson's garden. And we had to sheepishly go up to the front door to please, Mr. Richardson, can we have our ball back? You know? So I got talking to him, going back to that social structure I mentioned up front, he was one that was much higher than hers, he was a headmaster, so I find it di very difficult to just talk to him freely. But anyways, he obviously started mentoring me, and uh, he started by lending me some magazines called Weather, Weather Magazine, get me interested in weather. 
Uh, ten years later, when I did research, I actually published in that same magazine, but he's the one that got me started. And he also started lending me some meteorological instruments that I put in my backyard, 367 here. And I, I measured, you know, temperatures and humidities and that every morning for quite a number of years. When I went to Wigan Grammar School, I took all the meteorological measurements at Wigan Grammar School. When I went to Oxford, I took measurements for the Radcliffe Meteorological Observatory, which is the longest continuous meteorological station in the world. But it all started back with Frank Richardson. Right, that was my interest in weather and climate. I uh, ended up getting my PhD in climatology from Oxford. One of the other influences at school, the junior school, a uh, top class, a teacher was top Miss Barton. She loved, she lived the other side of Windy Arbor towards the village. But she really got me interested in geography. I remember her showing me things from around the world, uh, wheat from Canada, pineapples from the tropics, and talking about Eskimos and uh, Arabs and everything. And I thought, I'm living in this little place, I feel, and there's all this out there in the world. I've got to go and see it. So that's what I've done with my life. I've been to 90 countries, had a pretty good time. All started with Miss, Miss Barton. So my main subject at grammar school and university was geography, where I could continue to learn about the world and continue to specialize in, in climatology. It all came from, from here. The other interested, interesting person that had a big influence on me lived in this house here, Donald Anderson, throughout the Wigan coal field and iron and coal, bond bills and everything. So he got me really interested in, in the local history. Uh, these were, top two were just two photographs behind Highfield View, the backs where we, everybody had a backs, right? We used to play. And the field behind, Acker's Field, where we used to work with the horses and uh, getting the hay and everything. So that was my background. That's why Pony Dick around there is so important to me. And it's really shaped my life. And, I've continued to do research on it, and um, for me, there's, there's nowhere better. So, with that, I'll finish and throw it open. If you have any questions, or in corrections for me? I'm sure there's things I've said that are not quite right. <laughs> Can you verify that you are the only world-famous planetologist? Can you verify that you are the only world-famous planetologist? I can confirm that absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I can remember how much I got when they, they went, they whip, they whipped a hat around for collection when I got a hat trick. It was three shillings and four pence. <laughs> So, so I, I, I'll go with you. Uh, a couple of names you mentioned, Derek. Uh, uh, Copper's Cottage. Cop Copper's House, yeah. Uh, house. Um, up our end of town, we've got a Copper's Lane. Do you, you know there's a. Uh, a, a family, a copperous family, and uh, that were, were that will be giving their name to, to the places called this road, Winsonley and Hay. No, I don't know a family. I've always thought copperous is a mineral deposit. A mineral deposit. A mineral. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll have a look. And the other, the other thing I've got is that uh, Tucson House. Tucson, Tucson. Tucson. Uh, yeah. Which is uh, got a place in Arizona. Uh, oh, Tucson, Tucson, uh, Tucson Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> is there any Not that I know of. No. <laughs> Where? There's a village there. Oh, villas. Yeah, those were the new. They were built in 1940s. 
the original Tucson house was right to the south east side of the village that were built later. Yeah, I got a lot of that information from Bill Hurst, who uh, was in the Tucson Villas when, when I interviewed him. Yeah. Yes, Paul. Can, uh, yeah, the, uh, you referred to bringing up the red zone earlier on the North Side Zone, but it said that it ended up with a little bit long, a long way to bring it up. I'm just interested, I've got a little bit in terms of like the wicked name there. In terms of the Wigan dialect itself, and all the stuff on YouTube, it's really interesting. But a few men have brought 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 a few I don't know the specifics of that, but in America we tell people like the the Wigan accent is so different from the Scouse accent, just 18 miles away. You know, it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah the way that it's evolved. Yeah. yeah. Is it on? It's not on. <laughs> Shout. Hello. I don't know any more information on the fire though. It was built by John Clark. Uh, he had that lease starting 1792, so it would have been built soon after that in the 1790s. Uh, it, that's, that sketch that I showed you was an etching that was held by Wigan Library. When I inquired in Wigan Library 20 years ago if I could see the original copy, uh, they couldn't find it. That's the only one. Uh, I have a feeling the stone that was used to build it came from a little delf which today is at the bottom of Kolkos Drive. Used to be a Delft there, and I think that's where the stone came from. And I think it was built, according to San Forica, by the Fir Cups. The building are open, the M6, yeah, all that's true. Lost. Well, I mean, it's already gone. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no... The only evidence of, of that, if you go down Brook Lane, right at the bottom on the right hand side before you turn right to go over the bridge is a little lime kiln. Yeah, yeah. That's the only evidence that I can see. Yeah. 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 Poetry Cottage, yeah. Cafe. Cafe. <laughs> okay. And um, it's very true, the Beatles did. Yeah. Were quite yeah. Yeah. And I went into my way today for service of Ampar. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you got special treatment. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Something at the back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The the first the when that stone viaduct drop was built, um, when they put the main rail line through their 1848, they had to demolish one of the parts of the stone structure and they put in a new section there. They took part of the original bridge. If you're going over the bridge from bottom of Brook Lane up towards the hall, um, if you look about 200 yards further west along the railroad tracks, there's an old iron bridge that goes across that farmers use. 
that was part of the original. Yeah. Isn't it, 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 it true that, uh, that that was the first uh, viaduct to have a sea triangle? Yeah, the first, first, viaduct, first stone viaduct in the world to have a steam locomotive to go over. Yeah. Yeah. It's just some amazing history that's just gone. Yeah. It's not, it's not turned on. I can hear you, but nobody else can. I don't know, it's some fault. Anyway. No, go on, go on, go on. You know Rallon de Millbridge? Yeah. Um, those photographs were taken with your back. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah. Do you know when they, they, they opened the road? You got the road stick, the road stop with, with a railway line. The top. Yeah. That was the end of the road. Up to the new houses, the new houses. What did you show me? Yeah. 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 You know the year when it was opened up from, from the day? Up, up the Brecon Road? Yeah, up the Brecon Road. No, it was always an old road. Yeah, but I mean, up the Brecon Road. Uh, What's the right course for the Americans? Right. Well, I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, also on the Garland Hill Bridge, yeah. at the bottom end of the stone bed, is a, a scoop down. Yeah, Shamford. Can you tell me why it's Shamford? Yeah. So, yeah, if, if you, that first photograph I showed you, the stone bridge on this side looking across yeah. Billings Road to the other side. The bridge, the corner of the sandstone bridge is smoothed off because when Banks's colliery railway came down Bellabrow, one day the driver had his legs stuck out a bit too far and it, it got smashed. So after that they chamfered the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> 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 the overcast. Yeah, yeah. What were the overcast? I mean, I've been around for many years, I was 12, but I never know what they were. Yeah, you're talking about you're just going up Well Bride where you turn into Holmes House Drive, just on the corner there. The, on the old maps, the mark is charcoal ovens. So they, they must have used the local coal to make charcoal. Yeah. Because they opened gathered it later on, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did, yeah. Yeah, I've been on a tractor where front wheels went down on that field. Can you remember what the name of the pit was in Winky Ward? They don't know Winky Ward. In Winky Ward? Yes. Uh, it came from uh, Pony, Pony, Dick, Pony Dick Pit. It came from Windy Arbor. It was the same manager. Who was it? Windy Arbor. I can't remember the name. You can't remember? Can't remember. Why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> catch. He's trying to, catch, trying to catch me out. <laughs> I've got one last thing. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, summer sales pit only started in 1938. The, the banks' collieries. Windy Arbor was operating until what, 1970s? The 70s. It was could have been win, win, Windy sure. Arbor, would have been possible. But the, the other pits were closed then. Yeah, the Venture Pit closed. Um, 
probably 1870s. Anyone else have to do that? So I've got, I've got one book founded on coal, signed by me and Ray. It's up for offer. Anybody of great interest would like it. It's, it's antique auction. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You've got a picture of um, a lady's a lady's uh, trunk woman caught in the weaving chair. Yeah. All the all new kids were in the book. The women were. I have a book service. Oh, you do? You do you work? Do you work? Yeah. <laughs> 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 All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop you. Yeah. I'll be there. I, I, I think for. I think for anybody who lives in uh, in Winstonley and Highfield tonight, Winstonley must Six. have been absolutely fantastic. For for me, who's been brought up the other side of Wigan, uh, it, it's been boring. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's been enlightening. Uh, <laughs> But of course, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of every track on the world now. Uh, uh, absolutely fantastic. Incredible. Uh, the research is going to this is set to go on through it. Uh, it's cool. Um, and uh, all I can say is thank, thanks for the presentation tonight, Derek. It's, uh, it's been, well, you know, you filled the room, and I'm sure uh, it's just been Thank fun. you. Thanks. I appreciate seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, TJ is going to keep it going. Yeah, yeah. We're, uh, we would have paid Concord over, but it was top line. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, uh, yeah, thanks, Derek, very yeah, much. Thank you. It's great to have you back. Uh, I'll come back in another 60 years. <laughs> Derek, Derek is our chair and uh, uh, does a lot of work behind the scenes that you don't know about, and all the meetings that we have. Third Monday of, of every month, Derek chairs those. He can't be here every week, uh, every first, second Monday of the week when we have, have these presentations. Uh, I'm sure he'd like to be. Um, and I, I guess you've carried on what we've had uh, again, some fantastic people uh, giving uh, talks about, about the local. Uh, uh, life and history in, in depths that most of us have no idea about and couldn't dream about knowing them without the likes of yourself researching these things to the depth that you've really done. Thanks very much, Thank you. Thanks, Thank all. You. Ah, yes. Oh, it's working there. Oh, uh, flowers, flowers. There's uh, some flowers to be presented. Where are they? Well, I'm not going to present them. You know where they are. <laughs> Have you ever been presented with flowers before outside of the company? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, the full window. Of course, yeah. Uh -huh. oh. Yeah, there you go. Quiet, uh, our secretary. Uh, one for Linda. Thank you very much. Just for being so, so nice and putting up with uh, Derek.
speech, Linda, speech. Speech less. You know, I've had to listen. I just want everyone to know how much my husband loves living. Although he's been gone for 40 years, this is still his home. And I have tried to convince him that we can live over here for half a year in the U.S. for the other half, but he hates the weather here. So I'm not able to do that unless I can tranquilize him. But I just want you to know how much he enjoys Wigan and, and the history and the culture that Wigan has. It's something that we, in the United States, we don't have that. We're only about 200 and so years old, and many of us can't perceive the history, the culture that this country has. And it's just wonderful. So when we're here, we walk everywhere. Um, because he's afraid to drive after 40 years if he's driving the road. After a few months. And he doesn't trust me to drive on the road, so that doesn't work. But um, we've met so many wonderful people here at Paul and Claire and Jim and Jackie, and we have friends here, Eric and Maureen and Derek's family. So we are just so thrilled to come back and just want to thank you for your hospitality. And, um, I don't want to give my husband a big head, but Wigan is his thing. It, it's his it's his love, and I really admire that in him. And I really admire the society, your heritage um, society here, that does so much to try to keep what you have alive. We don't have that in the States. You are extremely fortunate. Thank you. For those, those of you who don't know, we have a dog back in Champaign, Illinois, and guess its name? Wigan. Right, right, I'm sure uh, there'll be people who'd like to have a few words with Derek and Linda and Annie from uh, the Valstorp, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. And um, we'll see you next month.